Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 27th meeting of 2018 of the Social Security Committee, 27th and final meeting of 2018 of the Social Security Committee, I'm pleased to say. Uh, to remind everyone uh, present to turn off mobile phones or other devices to silent mode so they don't disturb the meeting. Um, no apologies have been received the, this morning. And we move to agenda item one, declaration of interest. Uh, can I welcome Keith Brown, who is replacing George Adam on committee? I should, of course, first of all, uh, put my thanks to George Adam for his work on committee uh, in, in months gone by. Uh, and, of course, welcome Keith um, to the committee and can I invite Keith to declare any interests. Uh, can I refer the committee to my uh, entry in the members' register of interest, but I have no uh, registerable interest to declare? Thank you very much. You're most welcome. And we move to agenda item two, which is decision to take it items in private. And the committee is asked to agree that item five, consideration of evidence is taken in private. Is the committee agreed? Agreed. Okay. And I should note the committee is previously agreed to take item six in private, which is consideration of a draft report. Uh, we now move to agenda item three, appointment of the chair of the Poverty and Inequality Commission. The Child Poverty Scotland Act 2017 provided for the establishment of a commission, uh, a commission named the Poverty and Inequality Commission, which is to be established on the 1st of July 2019. The commission will be made up of a chair and between two and four additional members. The Scottish ministers may appoint a person as a member of the commission only if the Scottish Parliament has approved the appointment. The purpose of this evidence session is to allow the committee to reach a view about the suitability of the Scottish Minister's nominee for the position of chair. So can I therefore welcome Bill Scott, nominee for chair for the Poverty and Inequality Commission. Uh, good morning, Mr Scott. And can I congratulate you in securing the nomination. Thank you. Uh, and wish you well at this part of the appointment process. Uh, and I think uh, it falls upon myself to ask the first question. So just before um, you arrived, the other committee members were looking through some of the key skills required uh, to fulfil the job of chair. And one of them uh, was under the heading, a strong understanding of poverty and inequality issues in Scotland. And that seems as if we're, we're stating the obvious and saying that that should be a a core skill. So I think it would be easy to start off there, maybe ask you to, to demonstrate um, your, your knowledge in that area, but I, thought, I think it would be helpful would be any uh, practical experience on the ground in that area that you have, or any direct experience yourself. Yeah. Um, I myself uh, was born into a, a working class family in Scotland, a large family, five children. Uh, and although my father was a skilled worker, uh, he worked in the building trade and uh, there were periods when he was laid off where um, we experienced a fair bit of poverty. Um, unable to put fuel in the fire, uh, my mum having to borrow maybe to uh, put food on the table. Um, and uh, that has stayed with me all my life, the, the memories of that. And I also, you know, the memories of the community I was brought up in, which had a lot of solidarity between the members of that community uh, and helping one another when times got tough, uh, mainly a mining community. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the lived experience I have, but that's a long time ago now. Um, when I, I worked in the civil service for eight years uh, during the 1980s at the he height of a recession, mass unemployment, uh, and I worked in unemployment benefit. Uh, so, again, I saw a lot of um, people who had been in work, had, you know, been managing very successfully in their lives um, and uh, felt that they'd been thrown on the scrap heap and wanted, you know, a new start. Um, and, you know, I saw my role then and, I, you know, I still hope it is the role of many civil servants to help them get what they were entitled to. Um, and then I made the move to welfare rights uh, in uh, 1989, just after my daughter was born. Um, and um, at that point, you know, I wanted to, to move from being a, a, a gamekeeper of sorts to a, a better poacher, which is I wanted to help people get what they're entitled to and do more than I could as a civil servant. Um, actually fight appeal battles for them uh, and... Uh, 
just help them negotiate the system a wee bit more than we were allowed to uh, help people as civil servants. And uh, again, I worked in uh, an area of multiple deprivation down uh, in Pilton, in Granton, uh, in Edinburgh. Um, so a lot of experience uh, of assisting people and seeing them helping other people, um, you know, with the increased knowledge they had of the system to help people get their entitlements as well. Um, and I was director of the Anti-Poverty Alliance for five years. And during that time, my main role was to support local community projects, develop anti-poverty initiatives. Um, so, you know, I worked across Lothian um, and um, we, we managed to establish a number of different initiatives. I was talking about one just before I came in, a milk token initiative where people, you know, women primarily, used their milk tokens um, to uh, get milk from shops up until then. And we, we saw that there was an opportunity to buy the milk wholesale, give it to the women when they exchange their tokens, but also give them a community benefit, which was 50p into a credit union account for their child for every milk token handed in, 50p uh, towards a book token for their child, and uh, free fruit uh, that we handed out uh, with uh, you know, the exchange. And wh what we saw was the women coming back to us to do reading classes, uh, so that they could use the books that they were getting through the scheme. So they were educating themselves, <laughs> you know, to be able to, you know, interact with their children, to read to their children and things like that. So, you know, poverty is, it damages people in many different ways. And one way is actually that deprivation of human contact, deprivation of intellectual stimulation. And we, that was something that I saw the book took, you know, the milk token initiative through books and that doing a really big job of getting mothers and their children uh, to have real contact with one another. So it was not just tackling material deprivation, but tackling some of the other issues in, in the community. Uh, and the credit union stuff, I, I know it's not a lot of money, 50p a week sort of thing, but again, it was the idea is starting up a credit union account to get low cost credit at some point in that child's future when they grow up and to, to get the idea of saving for the future as well and putting away some money. Um, and the free fruit, obviously, uh, is a side benefit to you know, the health of the child and the mother, um, getting them something that actually was quite a premium in local shops um, where you know, an apple could cost, cost you as much as a pound of apples uh, out of the supermarket. So, you know, I've got a lot of practical experience in working with communities, and over the last 11 years, all of my policy work uh, for my employer, Inclusion Scotland, has been based on engaging with disabled people themselves, taking from their lived experience and bringing it back to Parliament to inform the policy making here. And I would see that as, as continuing uh, if I was uh, successful in being given the role the chair of the Commission. A little bit more about that, because I suppose the rules of engagement change a little bit, where you're maybe previously feeding ideas into government, some of which they take forward and some of which they don't. But once you take on this job, should you take it on as, as chair, chair of the commission, of course, there's a strong scrutiny role that you have. So uh, when looking at the current policy landscape, be that at a Scottish level or a UK level, uh, I, I'm assuming, well, I wouldn't just assume, because I'll give you the opportunity to put some of it on the record, that you'll be well up to speed. I would hope you're well up to speed in the current policy landscape. So I would ask you to say a little bit more about that, where the opportunities are in the current policy landscape, but also where some of your concerns are. I mean, the concerns are, are fairly easy to identify. You know, poverty uh, is increasing um, amongst families, uh, amongst children and in particular you know there's been a huge growth of poverty amongst working families um, and I think that the uh, targets that have been set are ambitious ones uh, they don't sound ambitious maybe if um, 
you look at it from the perspective of, well, we, it's, it's a long period over which to achieve this change, but actually it's in the opposite direction for the trend that is currently being established, which is that the number of children living in poverty is increasing year on year at the moment. So there are going to be huge challenges um, for the Scottish Government and its successors uh, uh, up until 2030 in actually reducing poverty. Um, some of those challenges are due to the level of benefits, the level of pay um, that uh, people are receiving in work, uh, the insecurity of many jobs nowadays, zero hours contracts, etc. Um, and the costs um, where wages are largely stagnant or have been largely stagnant for several years now, uh, but costs are rising. You know, um, and the, the main living costs, the cost of housing, cost of fuel, the cost of food are all rising. And for, for families, whether on benefits or in work, the challenges are getting larger and larger to try and meet their children's needs. So the Scottish Government has done things um, which will help in reduced costs, like child, increasing the number of childcare hours. Um, and it's initiatives like that at a governmental level, I think, uh, which reduce the cost to families, which could help. Um, obviously, you, Scottish Parliament has now got social security powers, which it didn't have before, but it's only got them in certain areas. It has to think how it can strategically use those powers to reduce poverty. And that's one of the key principles uh, in the Social Security Act, as it's been passed by this Parliament. So, you know, there's a number of areas where the Scottish Parliament has powers and can act, and there's a number of areas where it hasn't got the powers and can't act. It's not got powers over means-tested benefits. It's not got powers uh, over uh, the level of the minimum wage. So it has to be creative in thinking how it can use the powers it does have to, most be, to be most effective in reducing poverty. And I see part of the Commission's role as offering advice to ministers as well as holding them to account. Um, and I, again, that's part of the Commission's remit, is to look at what works, what doesn't work. And I believe that the people that know what works are those at the sharp end of poverty. They, they know. I'll just I'll take yeah. you the next, Pauline. Um, sure. I, I, th I think that's the heart of what my final question was going to be, and your Deputy Green will come in to, to follow up on and, and lots of this, and that is the relationship obviously changes uh, should you take on this role, and it is important. You said that you you, you would you would uh, well, hopefully a bit more about how you would scrutinise or challenge actions of government where you saw they weren't going far enough, or were going in a direction that might have had some unintended consequences. So, just a little bit more about maybe the experience you have in in providing such challenges over the years, and where you think areas that you might quite like, and you have to get your commissioners together first, but where you might quite like to concentrate on going forward? Um, well, certainly, I, I don't see it as my role only, and that, I think you're right, it's the Commission as a whole. Um, and I, I, again, one of the key tasks for me, if I was appointed, it would be to help recruit the other Commission members, because I do think it has to be a collective view that's reached and it, it's a view that has to be reached on the basis of the evidence that we are presented with and that we seek out for ourselves as to, again, what works and what doesn't work. Um, and, you know, there are... I, it, it'd be very difficult for me to say right now what the Commission will recommend to this Parliament, because I'm not the Commission, and, I, you know, I wouldn't pretend um, that, you know, to have those policies in place because they are something that we should come to and, uh, through a consensus on the Commission and after we've looked at the evidence. So, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for me to talk in generalities about Social Security, for example, but it's much more difficult for me to talk at the moment about what we might offer as advice in the future 
in terms of how to use the powers that the, the Parliament has and the government has. Advice that you might offer, I suppose it was examples of where you've done that bit of scrutiny oh, in, yeah. in, in a previous existence, and examples, are not, not what advice to government may be, but what areas you think are of particular interest for yourself to focus in on? I, I, you, you're, like you don't have the gig yet. You're not, due to, you're not then bound by whatever you, you see here. But I think it would be interesting for the committee to know what your thinking would be in areas that you might want to focus on as well. Yeah. Um, again, the work plan of the commission will be drawn up by the commission itself, not just by me. But you know, social security is one area for example, where I have a lot of experience and I've appeared in front of this committee a number of times. Um, and I do believe there's potential there uh, for the use of powers uh, in terms of top up, uh, in terms of targeting, um, to be most effective in helping those families that face the greatest risk of falling into poverty. And that would include families with disabled children and disabled parents, but it would also include lone parent families uh, BME families, etc. So that's one area. Um, the other area might be in the uh, area of costs. Uh, what other costs uh, are impacting on people's lives, like housing, and where could government action be most effective in reducing those costs? Um, another area in, in terms of eliminating um, poverty in the future would be educational attainment. Um, uh, etc. Um, and again, what can uh, the government do to make sure that children coming from poorer households get the same opportunities in life as uh, other children do? So that you know, there, there's a, a large range of areas where this parliament and the government have powers where the commission could be effective in making recommendations. In terms of myself and holding the government to account, I think. Um, people know, you know, I've, I've um, engaged uh, over quite a period of time um, with uh, government um, and, and uh, looked at legislation uh, with a critical eye uh, when it's been proposed. Um, and I hope I've managed to work successfully um, both with uh, parliamentarians and government in amending that legislation to improve it. Uh, I can give an example in terms of the Social Security Act, which is uh, very recent, um, where um, one of our objectives was to make sure that all disabled people would have access um, to advocacy support. Um, now, that was something that the Minister was not in favour of at the outset. Uh, we had to um, convince her that that would help in her objective in getting it right first time for the agency. And I think that is when scrutiny works best, let's say, is when you can convince those who you've got a difference with that actually what you're asking them to do will help them attain their objectives. So if the parliament and the government's objectives are to reduce poverty, and we can show as a commission that carrying out certain actions will help in that task, I think that makes government's role easier and it makes the commission effective in its role. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm certainly used to holding government to account. Um, again, uh, anybody has read our briefings, uh, usually prepared by myself or one of the staff that I manage, uh, will we'll see that you know, we praise government where they take the right action and we hold them to account where we think they could be doing better. Um, and, and that's always been uh, my point of view is we're there to assist government in, in doing uh, its job better. Um, and uh, that's the government of whatever political view. Uh, Very helpful. And yeah. I know some of the information that I'm asking for, you might think members around this table know already, and maybe they do, but you know, this is, a public, this is the public facing part of the process. It's important to put that on, on the record for, for yeah. folk out there that are yeah. that are watching proceedings here today. That, that, that is my questions for the moment. Uh, Polly McNeill. Thanks. Uh, good morning, Bill. Uh, we know each other well. You've appeared many occasions. There, there's no question over, I think, the, the, I think the very valuable work you've done with the committee. Um, you'll also be aware that 
The appointment itself, the fact that we do have a Poverty and Inequality Commission is a really important piece of work that this committee is integral in persuading the government that this is the right thing to do. So I think it's a really important appointment. I have two questions. You probably covered the first one quite well, but for me, it's very important to just get this on the record. Um, you must obviously uh, be willing to challenge the government where that is necessary because there has to be an arm's length relationship. And I just would like you to see a wee bit more about that because for me, uh, when we come to private discussion with the committee, is to, uh, I need to hear from you about the level of independence you seek to have from the government when it comes to probably the biggest single issue for this parliament, which is tackling poverty. And can you say that you feel that you uh, will be robust with the government on the question of poverty when the time comes? Again, you know, if anybody's not heard me speaking about it, um, it's a passion. Um, and I, I sometimes have to apologise for how passionate I get about this. I get angry uh, when I see how people's lives are damaged by poverty, um, and especially when it could be prevented. Um, I Honestly, there, I have no doubts as to my ability to be independent of government and hold them to account, um, uh, because if, if they're not doing something to reduce poverty, if they're not doing everything they can do to reduce poverty, I want to know why. And, and, and I think you know, the Commission's role has to be one, you know, holding the government to the highest standards that it can. Um, and that, again, as I say, is regardless of whatever political persuasion the government has, I, can, I can't predict over the lifetime uh, both the, you know, the child poverty plan you know, up to 2030, um, who will be in power. Um, or, or whatever, and it doesn't really matter to me. Um, I've worked with uh, parliamentarians of uh, every political party represented in this p parliament um, to try and improve legislation, um, and I'll continue to do that, um, uh, regard regardless uh, whether I get this position or not, um, because, you know, I feel that if people do want to achieve positive change, I'm, I'm willing to work with them to do that. And, and I think you know, any government, uh, now or in the future, uh, I'm willing to work with them, but I'm also um, quite a hard taskmaster in terms of looking for the best possible outcomes for the people. And I, you know, I see the Commission as trying to represent those without a voice uh, in our society, and that is a lot of people living in poverty. Um, who feel abandoned um, by mainstream politics, um, don't turn out to vote on, on many occasions, etc. We have to reach out to them and say that, that you know, not only do we care about it, we're doing something about it. It's not just walking the walk, it's, you know. I have a second question. So you gave a bit of a critique of your analysis of poverty in response to the convener. There's a couple of things you didn't mention. Uh, the first is... Naomi Eisenstadt, who's talking, it's the government's own advisor to the first years of the parliament, um, talks extensively about poverty being more than income. It's about the power balance in society. It's about the networks. If you're poor, you don't have the same networks. Um, I just want to be keen to hear that you, that's, you share a view on that. And just secondly, just for quickness. Um, in the Child Poverty Act, you'll be aware that some of us supported amendments successfully on disability, people with disability, and on the issue of single parents. And we've seen through the universal credit story that single parents seem to be a group that are highly discriminated against when it comes to poverty. But you didn't mention single parents so far, and I just want to be clear that that is part of the analysis that you would share on the poverty. I think I did mention single pairs. I think they, they've done worse to, uh, um, altogether. Um, my uh, background, again, um, back to when I was a welfare rights worker, um, I specialised in employment rights. And um, I worked with a number of women's organisations at that time um, to try and use European law um, to extend rights to women um, for holiday entitlement. And it was largely women because they're, they're part-time workers that were denied um, what should have been the rights. And, and I've kept that 
up ever since. And you know, I still work closely with Close the Gap and Gender, Scottish Women's Aid, etc. Uh, and particularly One Parent Family Scotland, um, who convene or, or act as the secretariat, secretariat for the Scottish uh, campaign on welfare reform. Um, so, you know, I know the gender aspects of poverty, uh, know, know them very well. And um, again, you know, we have to take into account women's experience um, which can be different and more intense than men's experience of poverty um, because they're the ones with the, you know, are left often with the care and responsibilities and, and that task of putting food on the table um, when there isn't enough money coming into the house. So, you know, certainly, you know, I, 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 it keeps on coming back to lived experience for me is, is, is absolutely key in learning, you know, what are the, the main difficulties facing those living in poverty? And then taking that back and then looking at what your responses can be to tailor them to meet the needs of those that are most affected by your know, major policy change. And that, you know, in the last few years has been disabled people and, and lone parents, et cetera. Um, but as I say, working families are also uh, now, you know, 66 uh, percent or so of all children in poverty are living in working families. So we need we need to address those issues uh, as well, um, and that's particularly the case for working lone parent households, where childcare really doesn't suit. So again, it's not just about having more childcare; it's about having wraparound childcare that actually allows women to make the choices with their lives that they, they would like to make, uh, and if they want to work allow them to do that. Thank you very much. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, good morning, Bill. Again, as uh, Pauline has said, we've worked closely together, particularly around the uh, um, Social Security Bill. And I, I suppose I have two questions just to um, probe a wee bit further. I mean, the, the first one is um, in regard to your kind of, if I can put it, your full-time job at present. Um, clearly, Inclusion Scotland, um, are quite close to Scottish government in some way that you, you do have a door open, that you can speak to ministers, which I think is a very positive thing. Um, how would you see that balancing between maybe one morning having to go and be a lobbyist and then the next morning being the convener of this group? And do you see any conflict between the two? And if so, how would you manage that? I think that's a fair question, Jeremy, and it's one I was asked at my earlier interview as well. Um, I think that I, I don't see why um, it should affect um, the day job in, in one way um, because they're two completely separate roles. And, and, and I don't just speak about Social Security um, when I'm, I'm going to see government, nor most of the time I'm going to see ministers, um, as, you, as you know. Um, I've, I've been working with the agency since, since it's been established earlier this year. Uh, and various stakeholder reference groups. And it, I don't go in there as a lobbyist. I go, I go in there to try and share my knowledge of what works for disabled people and, and, and tell them about what doesn't work uh, and encourage them to ask disabled people themselves and involve disabled people themselves in the policy making, et cetera. Um, so in, in a lot of ways, I don't think it'll, it'll matter that much, but I, I do acknowledge that on public uh, you know, occasions, the conflict might look more obvious. Um, and I think we, we're going to have to discuss internally in Inclusion Scotland about who speaks out on, on an issue when disability and poverty are being discussed um, to make sure that it's not me. And similarly, within the Commission, um, I would, I'd be reluctant to speak on disability and poverty issues, I'd hope another commission member might actually do it. Otherwise, it's maybe going to look like me just harking on and using one as a platform for the other. And I don't want it to be seen in that way. Uh, nor do I, I think that you know, my interests and, and my you know, passion about reducing poverty are limited to disabled people. Um, as I say, my background is I've worked in equalities right across 
um, the main equalities groups. You know, I've, I've, I, although I've never worked for an LGBTI organisation, I've worked alongside them, again, uh, on cross-sectional and intersectional issues. So, you know, I, I take the poverty and inequality part of the Commission's role really seriously. Um, and, and, and I, as I said, I think arrangements would have to be made for somebody else to be speaking out on Inclusion Scotland's behalf if it was disability and poverty, and somebody else being speaking out on the Commission's back behalf if it was disability and poverty. But other than that, I don't think you know, that the vast majority of the work that I do um, is lobbying uh, as such. I do a lot of lobbying with yourselves, so you probably know me for that. But you know, a lot of the work I do is very practical work uh, and try to assist um, not just government, but other third sector organisations, um, public sector organisations, and trying to improve their services so that in practice they deliver for disabled people. And again, I can I can see how the Commission could help in that in terms of uh, local child poverty plans, but it would be you know, as evidence-based approach about what works at a local level based on what people in local communities tell us. <clears throat> and that's helpful, and thank you. I mean, I suppose, to be absolutely transparent, I think you and I come from probably the political opposite uh, extremes, um, although we can cooperate quite often on uh, specific issues. I mean, clearly, you know, and you have made it very clear within your application that you, you have political affiliations, which I think are pretty well known. Um, do you, again, how do you lay aside your own personal political views and then work with maybe, I mean, let's just for a moment um, imagine, you know, 2021, it's a very different government from a very different political perspective. H how would you see that working in a constructive way? I mean, I go back to you, Jeremy, you know, I, as, as a, an employee of a charity, um, I have, I have to operate in a non-political or apolitical way uh, when I go about my work, and I hope that I do. Um, and, and in doing so, I'm, I am, and, and this is genuine, personally as well as, as well as my role, I've always been able and willing to work with anybody that, want, that wants to work with you know, the organisation I've been working with, whether that's Inclusion Scotland or Lothian Anti-Poverty Alliance or Lothian Racial Equality Council or whatever, to try and effect change that will better the lives of the people that I'm there to try and represent. Um, so, you know, there, I know that everybody that comes in here as an elected member wants to change the world for the better. So do I. So the, the starting point is is very similar in some ways. And that's what makes it easy to work with, with people uh, who are trying to achieve positive change, whatever their political background and beliefs. And, and I have respect for everybody that, that's doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, Mark Griffin. Thanks, Commissioner. Morning, Bill. Um, in your application, you um, talk about the, the fact that higher proportions of uh, black and minority um, ethnic people, disabled people and, and women are living in poverty. And then today you've spoken about um, those at the sharp end of poverty being best placed to come up with solutions and that your um, first role, should you be appointed, will be um, in the recruitment of commission members. So um, how would you um, see that role in, in recruitment and reflecting um, those are at the sharp end, black and minority ethnic, um, disabled and, and women uh, in forming the membership of the, the Commission. I mean, I'd, I'd be very keen. I mean, again, it won't be me that's making this whole selection and it have to be based on the public po appointment process. But I would be very keen to work um, with um, those that are uh, working in public appointments to try and encourage uh, applications for, the, for those very groups that you've just listed, Mark, um, because, you know, I, I fundamentally believe that if the Commission doesn't have lived experience in its own membership, we won't, you know, be driven uh, by the current 
you know, needs is, is, is the groups that are, are most affected by poverty. Um, we we can you know do our best to reach out, and I, I, you know, I'm at the moment actually I, I, I'm thinking about this as a potential conflict of interest in the future. Uh, I'm a member. I'm a board member of the Poverty Alliance, and it has uh, board members who are, are on it who've got lived experience. Uh, I'd be encouraging people like that to apply um, from you know, disabled people's organisations, from lone parents' organisations, etc. Because I've met these individuals, I know that they could uh, perform a useful role in the commission. You know, I, I have, you know, almost it's certainly weekly contact with group, you know, groups and individuals living in, in poverty, and and I think, you know, I've got certainly some of the contacts that I, I, I could be using myself to encourage people to come forward. I'm really, really keen that they get over the hurdles um, in the public appointment system and and make it on onto the uh, commission. Um, because, as I say, we'd, we'd be missing something if we didn't manage to try and represent the society, but particularly the people living in poverty in, in, in Scottish society. Uh, I doubt if there'll be all the members, you know, but we can do our best um, to try and ensure that the right people come forward and that they're supported uh, through the application process as well. Um, my own organisation currently helps people um, you know, who are going um, for public appointments. And I, I, there are a number of other organisations that do. Um, uh, and the Poverty Alliance has got Get Heard, um, which is, again, encouraging people to take on these sort of responsibilities, get their voices heard at a higher level. And, I, you, know, you know, it's reaching out through groups like that that we should be able, I hope, to attract at least some people to the Commission and to applying to the Commission and hopefully getting through the appointment process and onto the, onto the Commission. Thank you. Okay, Alison Johnson. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Bill. Um, you obviously have a, a great deal of expertise and experience in this area, and it's clear that you're passionate about the subject matter, which uh, um, you know, I think is hugely important. Um, a chair is a really key role in any organisation, and I'd just like to understand how you will... I, th I think, um, you know, we as a Social Com Security Committee find it challenging scrutinising some of this legislation because it's very technical, it's complex. Um, you know, I appreciate your, your background in welfare rights, but I'd just like to understand how you will help sort of lead the Commission understand the legislative opportunities that there are and how you will keep abreast of any developments between the two parliaments to, to ensure that the Commission can deliver as optimally as we'd all like it to? Well, I mean, again, um, as a policy professional for a long time now, um, I'm, I'm certainly used to digesting a lot of documents, etc. but I'm also used to producing briefings, which I hope are accessible to people. Um, and I know where to look. <laughs> and I, I, I know the legislative process probably inside out, maybe not quite as well as some of the MSPs here, but you know, um, as well as anybody that's maybe not a parliamentarian can. I worked in here for four years as well, um, and I, you know, I've worked with um, Spice. And, you know, in the past, I'm part of the expert group uh, externally to Spice on Social Security. So I, I know where the information sources are, and I know how to make it information intelligible. Um, and I'm sure you know, working with the Secretariat um, of the Commission, we are going to be able to brief people about what the opportunities are, what some of the um, barriers are to, to uh, affect and change. And I think make well-reasoned and um, good um, recommendations to government about, about how to go about um, their job in, in trying to reduce poverty. I don't just see it as a national thing, though. You know, um, certainly, that's the Commission's role, is, is to advise and hold the government to account. But again, if we can assist local authorities and NHS boards and how they go about their child poverty planning, and you know, I, you know, I, 
It's a, an ex-colleague that's working at Improvement Services, uh, Hannah McCulloch from Child Poverty Action Group. I know her well, I've worked with her for years. She comes from the same background as me in terms of working with disabled people's organisation at one point. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of work we could do to try and encourage bottom-up approaches as well as top-down approaches. And I think that will be just as important in many ways because I was talking to someone just before coming in about how cre credit union, for example, some I've been in since I was a low-paid worker um, and, and was really helpful to us and given us low-cost you know, low credit, et cetera. Um, that's something, you know, an idea that I know government supports and wants to see rolled out further. You know, we should be, as a commission, I hope, maybe saying how can we provide low-cost credit? Because, again, that reduces the cost and makes the income go further. So you might not be able to raise wages, but if you can reduce costs, you know, that's, that's another effective way of reducing poverty. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kambia. Okay, Shona Robison. Um, hi there. Well, I've got two questions for you. The first is um, there can sometimes be a bit of cynicism about commissions and what they can achieve. I'm sure you're more than aware of that. So, you know, what would you say to that in terms of in five years' time, what, what would you anticipate the commission will achieve that would make a, a tangible difference? If we, if we haven't made a tangible difference, I'll really concern myself a failure. I mean, that's, you know, and, and you know, the commission a failure. Um, we, we need to have, be realistic about what can be achieved, but we also need to really push government to do everything it can. Um, and I think that's going to become even more important over the next few years. Potentially, it could be a fallout for Brexit and, and the economy. Um, you know, there could be more people uh, getting pushed into poverty, um, even than there are just now. Um, so the Commission, it can only do so much. It's, it's not got the levers itself. Um, but if we come up with good evidence-based recommendations, and we look at what would be most effective, you know, I hate using the phrase, big, you know, biggest bangs for your bucks, but how do you use your powers and how do you use the financial resources of government to affect the most amount of change that you can? Um, and, you know, that'll be like, you have to make difficult choices at times about what the priorities are for change. Um, so, you know, as a commission, I would, I would see it very much as a collegiate approach um, where everybody has to own the recommendations that we are making and that's sometimes difficult arguments that you're going to be having. But again, I'm used to doing that. Not, you know, I've served on a number of boards. Um, we've not always seen eye to eye. But again, if you come to it, as I said earlier, with the same approach that you've, you've got, a, a job to do and what your job is is to make the best possible recommendations for the groups that are hardest hit you'll you're starting for the right place you've, you've got the same aim uh, and and I, I i do think you know that the commission can make a positive difference uh, in terms of making good recommendations to government which are non-political um so you can you know your, your justification for doing things could could be, you know, this isn't coming from a, from our political agenda. This is what the child, uh, what the Poverty and Inequality <laughs> Commission have recommended that we do, and therefore, you know, they've they've come to us with an evidence-based case, and yeah, we're going to have to do that. And it could be, it, it might not be always popular things that you're going to have to do, not popular with all the society that is. Um, and that, that can be difficult uh, in politics. But if you've got good evidence behind it and you know that it will be most effective, then in some ways uh, the Commission can help um, in, in providing you with the ammunition to counter the detractors who, who don't want that particular action to be taken. Because it's a, a, a more objective um, role that the Commission should be playing. Okay, and just finally, you said earlier on about people um, overcoming the hurdles in the public appointment system, something I 
feel quite strongly ab about how do we make it easier for people from more v varied walks of life and backgrounds to get into serving the, the public good? I mean, it, it's, it's not just in public appointments. I mean, I, you know, in general, employment recruitment, I think, has become more difficult for mm. people in a lot of ways. Competency-based approaches are good and, and, and that they look at what your experience says they're doing something and I think you explain how what you did affected change or within your, your workplace or within society or anything. But I think it, it's quite difficult for a lot of people who've not got that sort of experience uh, applications to, to word their application to get through a competency-based um, uh, application process. So again, at Inclusion Scotland, we've been working with disabled people to try and talk them through it, what would be best to go into the application. And I think that sort of coaching <coughs> should be available to people from low-income backgrounds, that, you know, whatever, BME, loan parents, etc., that want to go through the public appointment process. You know, if, if you can make it available, it's, it really is it's worth its weight in gold because people have often got the experience, they just don't know how to express it on paper. And once they're in an interview, they often can um, you know, make a convincing case why they, they should be uh, given a post uh, or an appointment. So it's getting them through that first stage, I think, is, is crucial to get, to get them at least in front of a selection panel. Um, and you know, I, I think the public appointments could be, do, you know, could be doing more to, to reach out to those who are underrepresented on, on uh, public boards, etc., to, to try and encourage them, but also give them the tools that they need to, to tackle what, for them, is a new sort of way of expressing themselves. Because usually they've just been asked to list what they've done, rather than, you know, say exactly what they did um, within that role that benefited the organisation they worked for. You know, so, yeah, I think we could be doing more. And I, you know, again, I hope that we can maybe, I, I'm not going to be able to maybe <coughs> do it as chair of, chair of the commission if I'm appointed, but I, I hope I can maybe encourage some of the groups I know are, are out there working with, you know, gingerbread, etc., working with lone parents to, to actually work with anybody that's making an application to this. To, to talk them through the competency-based stuff so that they, they give themselves the best chance they can. Okay, okay. okay Michelle Ballantyne. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Um, I suspect you've probably met all of us at some point. So, uh, um, the, I've got three. One is just a, a quick clarification, um, and it, that was that you say you took up the post of acting manager of inclusion in 2011, and then you refer to yourself as still acting manager. Is that... No, I'm not. I'm, no, I was I'm, I'm, def I'm deputy uh, chief exec. Right. Uh, yeah, of, that's, that's, I just wanted to clarify that yeah. because it was on your thing, so I thought I'd misunderstood yeah. it. Um, two things, really, um, that I want to pick up on. One is around the fact that social security is a safety net. Um, you know, it, it's the thing that should help people when things are not going so well <laughs> or when things have gone wrong and bounce them back onto their feet again. But in terms of the, the role of the Poverty and Inequality Commission, how do you see its role in terms of the preventative agenda? You know, preventing the need in the first place for that social security net. Can you talk a wee bit about that first? It's, you know, I, I do believe prevention is better than cure. Um, and, you know, if, if you can have a well-performing economy, um, where people are adequately rewarded for the work that they do, um, you can certainly prevent a lot of poverty in our society. Um, but not everyone, again, I agree with you that Social Security is a safety net at times of crisis, but for some people um, it, it's also there, for example, to meet the extra cost of disability. And these, these can be continual rather than uh, one-off costs. Um, so you, you have to think again about what the purpose of different benefits are um, to use them most effectively. Um, 
so again, you know, I, I've I've heard talk um, within government, civil servants, etc. You know that um, perhaps uh, you could have a scheme like mobility, but for fuel costs um, and uh, through bulk buying, you could reduce um, the overall cost to a household. And I, you know, again. That is part of a preventative approach. If if you can, you'll use the resources that are there to reduce the costs of low-income households. You're acting to prevent one of the th one of the key costs that can plunge a family from managing to not managing uh, by reducing fuel costs. So, you know that again. I think we we need to seriously look at that idea. Um, I've, I've not come to any conclusions. Commission in terms of that preventative well, agenda? That, is, is that, 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 would, terms of that would be it. Mm. You know, the Commission's role would be to examine the evidence, what could be achieved, what cost savings could be affected, maybe by, by such a change in policy, how many people would that affect, how many people would it lift, how many children would it lift out of poverty, uh, etc., and then present objective conclusions to government about this is what we think could be achieved by by doing this or not doing it or this alternative approach might be a better one you know in other words weigh up see wh what are the what are the best options within that because again that's been talked about in terms of disability benefits but again i know that some local authorities have been looking at it for tenants as well so again it's well which which one maybe has the best best chance of success and buy-in by the people that you're attempting to reach because the whole idea of it is the more people that join in the scheme, the bulk buying power increases and the lower the cost that you can achieve. So you, you want a scheme, if, if you were to go after something like that, um, where more people to participate um, than don't. Um, so how how do you best achieve that? And as I say, that that would be the commission's role is to weigh up these options and hopefully make the correct recommendation to government about which of them would would be most effective. And in terms of drawing evidence, um, you know, you say to to look at the evidence and present it. Do you see the commission's role in terms of drawing evidence from from? work other people have done or do you see the commission's role in actually engaging with people wider and and drawing Bo their own evidence both mm -hmm. both um i i would hope that we will engage with people that are doing it right at the grassroots mm -hmm. um right down to community level um about you know what works um in their local community and whether that can you know whether you can rule that out at a national level. Some solutions might just be that. They're local solutions to local issues and they work well there, but they might not work well elsewhere. Other ones might have that pos potential to, to, to be introduced across communities across Scotland, in which case that, that would be something I would hope the Commission would be saying to government, look at this, look in terms of working with local authorities and NHS boards, could they be supporting community initiatives like this within their own areas? Uh, because this seems to work, you know. Um, so it, it is about testing things, but it will be about going right down to local community level, but it also will be seeking evidence from, you know, those with the greatest amount of knowledge on that particular issue. So I'm, you know, I wouldn't pretend to be an, an expert on fuel poverty. I would want to speak to people who are the experts. That's people who live in it. But it's also sometimes those that can say, well, you know, this, this is how you could purchase um, you know, electricity, power, whatever, uh, and use it um, to, to reduce the costs. Uh, I the fence, the employers, yeah, suppliers. Exactly. Yeah, the exactly. And the other element for me is around... As chair of, of the commission, whilst I, I, I hear what you're saying about inclusivity and everybody else in particular, I was interested in your response to Shona Robson's question about having that broader base of people on the commission. But your role 
particularly in the first year, is very much going to be about setting the ethos, driving the agenda, ensuring that you have um, a focus on what you're going to do. So I'd like to bring it tighter to you and say, for you, if you were appointed as chair, what do you want to achieve in that first year? What will you judge your success by at the end of the first 12 months in terms of looking back and saying, have I delivered as, as chair in that first year? I mean, the first thing is the recruitment. Um, that's, that's going to be key, um, that we get the breadth of experience as, as, you know, that we need on the commission um, so that we, we've got different voices, different expertise, um, so that you know, I can, as I say, f the, I would want to be able to know that the other commissioners were bringing something to the table um, that I don't have. You know, um, uh, so I would expect the same equal amount of passion about reducing poverty, but I would I would want them to have expertise in other areas, more knowledge than I have in those areas. And I would want us in the first year to establish what our work programme is going to be, what, what are the priorities uh, f that we want to look at, um, establish a risk register, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, make sure that we're um, trying to avoid any damage that we, you know, could be done to the Commission's reputation, etc. Um, but also how to establish us in the public eye as being independent of government and uh, there to listen um, to the communities um, that we want uh, to work with um, to try and improve their own lives. So. I, I suppose it's establishing an independent persona to the Commission, a work programme that's achievable, um, and, um, as I say, setting our, our own priorities, um, which would be to show our independence for government, but also, but also looking at what is happening and making sure that we, we are fitting in, to an extent, with a what the policy agenda is, because you, can't, you can be independent in terms of commenting, but you need to know what is happening on, on the ground to be able to influence it. So if you know there are opportunities coming up, it would be stupid to ignore them. So we need, we need to do you know, the full sort of analysis that we would do you know, um, in, in setting you know, a policy for any organisation and working out a business plan. Um, so, uh, you know, the important role is to get us established. That's recruitment, setting, a, setting your sails to the wind and saying which direction you're going to go in and then getting on with it. And that, that is enough for a first year, I think. Um, thereafter, we would hope to have more influence, I think. Um, but the first year is, is, is really getting solidly established so that we know we're working on the right issues and that the recommendations which we eventually make will be solidly grounded in evidence. Mm -hmm. so. How do you, I mean, in terms of, you know, not establish yourself as independent from government, how, and there's been some questions asked earlier, how do you think you can establish yourself as independent in terms of being politically neutral, so evidence-based rather than any kind of political base? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, for me, it's not... It, it, the question is really there. We need to be seen as independent of the government, which I think means at least speaking to some of the communities who feel neglected, who feel that they're not um, being heard, and saying we are here to listen in some ways, and you know, give us your ideas about how you want to see us tackle this problem, uh, a persistent poverty in our society. And, you know, we're not just going to listen to you, we're going to take on board what you're telling us. And I think, you know, I know government does that as well, but, you know, the Commission, the commission I think, by going out and, and being seen uh, to not just 
talk the talk but walk the walk and actually eventually making recommendations which as I say might be difficult for government to live with um, that's when we'll be seen as fully independent um, you know probably not until then um, not until we make some of the difficult uh, judgments that we're going to have to make but you know but we can start that process at least in the first year by speaking out on poverty um, and and really trying to convince our society that it's something that has to be tackled. Because I don't just think poverty damages the lives of people living in poverty. I think it damages the whole fabric of society. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a message that we have to get out. That, you know, we might be talking about dealing with this problem, but that is a problem for everybody, not just for those living in poverty. Okay, thank you. Okay, I've got one final question um, from Keith Brown, MSP. Um, before we draw to a close, we'll probably be on for a lot of time here, but I thought it was just, I talked to the Deputy Convener there, that given this is the first time we've carried out this process, uh, and it's open, public and transparent, we want to give as much time as possible for questions. Uh, I don't see any other bids for questions other than Mr Brown at the moment. If there is, please catch my eye, but it would have to be brief. But uh, some final line of questioning from Keith Brown. It was uh, two questions, if it's possible, uh, Convener, not the five that Michelle asked, but uh, two, uh, and I'm happy for them to be brief answers, but the first one is, um, on the one hand, uh, we have quite actually similar backgrounds, although there was six kids in my family right enough, but um, like you, I've been in the public sector for a long time and had to argue throughout that time to make sure, for example, that councils put into their anti-discrimination policies the grounds of political views, which surprising it was hard to do with a number of councils so I would abhor any idea that we would try and preclude somebody because of their political views and I would hope that would be taken forward in the appointment of the Commission members. On the other hand, you mentioned before the voiceless and I just wonder how inevitably being a product of all the different organisations that you've been working with in the anti-poverty field, very good people, very good organisations, there are people as you yourself identified who won't relate to any of those bodies and they are completely cut off. Uh, they don't vote, as you said. How would you intend that the Commission would engage with people like that? You know, that, that's, that might take a longer answer than, you, than, than, than the question. Um, I think there is work that you can do to reach those people. Um, it, it's not easy. Um, you know, again, I've worked with homeless people um, and... Uh, they, they can be some of the most difficult people to reach, but there are always somebody that they have to be in contact with. Um, and quite often, uh, in their case, it's uh, health services. Um, uh, so you have to, I, I think you have to think of the groups that you're trying to reach and think where they have to go and then try and reach them through that. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a big supporter, for example, of welfare rights in health settings because I, th I think that's where people who are in the greatest need often go. And it, it, even when they've completely lost contact with local authority, uh, et cetera. So, but to group, bring them together is a much bigger task. And um, I think there's been some successful work done by agencies like Oxfam, the Poverty Alliance, et cetera, to reach those groups. But there's always people that are, that are really on the margins. And again, you just have to, in some ways, take them and try and take them into account, even though they're not always present. Um, but keep on thinking about how how do we bring them into the tent and to, to begin that discussion? Because there are techniques to reach now, as I say, through health services, etc., where you can reach some of them that might you might not otherwise reach. But there always will be very difficult uh, groups. Uh, and the second question was, in relation to the Smith Commission and the, what is now the devolved settlement, it strikes me that with experience, you can see in some areas it's a complete nightmare. It does not work. Um, consumer protection is just bizarre. Without asking you to say which power should rest where, in the field that you expect to be covering, is there one measure that you think and I'm not saying that it should be devolved or re-reserved or whatever, is there one measure which you think would make a big difference if it lay with uh, the government that it doesn't currently lie with, if you can follow that? Yeah. Well, um, I mean, 
past record on the Smith Commission is, is fairly well known um, that we argued for all social security powers to be devolved. That's, that's included in Scotland's view. Um, it's probably my own as well because I think you know, a mishmash of social security lying in one place and another doesn't, it's, it's not easy uh, for policy makers. Um, so I would like to see it, but that's a personal view, I have to say, not the Commission's view, because the Commission will take its own view. Um, and, you know, I, yeah, I, I think that area, um, more devolution in that area might, might be helpful, um, because it, it, it can lead to more coherent policy responses, um, you know, where you can tailor all the benefits to, to do the job that you, you want to do. But, you know, that isn't the situation and I, we have to work with what we've got. So, um, you know, we have to look at, as I say, utilising the powers we do have to the, to the utmost effectiveness. And I, I do think there are ways, you know, like um, Scottish gov government, Scottish Parliament doesn't have power over the minimum wage. Therefore, they've chosen to go down the living wage route and encourage employers to to begin paying their staff the living wage. That is, you know, it's been effective for thousands of workers. Um, and, you know, there is so much you can do by encouragement and uh, other means. Um, and that, again, we need to think about what we can do, um, you know, through things like the living wage campaign, um, as well as, you know, what we can't do. Um, thank you. Can, can I just, you know, one final thing. I mean, I was asked right at the outset what my vision was, and my vision is a Scotland free you want and, and uh, hunger and stigma of poverty. And, uh, I, you know, I think that's what everybody in this room wants to achieve. And I hopefully, if I was appointed, that, that, that would be something we could work collectively on. OK, uh Thank you very much, Mr Scott. It probably is the first time I've felt I've been sitting in what feels like a job interview experience in a public session of Parliament, so a little bit artificial. Uh, had it been a normal witness session, I suspect would have uh, truncated some of your responses and some of the questioning as well, but I, I felt we had just let that run its course for, for public transparency. There's no point in doing these things unless... And, and let, unless we let, we let them run their course. But thank you for your time this morning. I should, of course, inform you that uh, our committee will um, report back to Parliament uh, in relation to the appointment decision uh, before us, and we'll hope to do that in, in, in good order. So can I thank you for your time this morning and wish you a very happy Christmas when it comes as well. Uh, and we now move to agenda item four, which is a decision to take another agenda item at future meetings in private. The committee is asked to agree that the discussion about its next potential inquiry uh, on housing, I understand, will be held in private at its uh, next meeting. Is the committee agreed? OK, and we now move to agenda item five, where we have previously agreed to take it in private, so we now move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>